This video is going to include a review of some of the fundamental accounting topics that hopefully you will find useful. The slides have been adopted from the Intermediate Accounting Edition 8 Spiceland et al. textbook. You have access to that full textbook and so uh, and actually you have access to the full set of PowerPoint slides uh, from chapters 1 and 2 so that's where many of these slides came from. I've just selected the ones that I thought would be most beneficial for us for this review. It is not an intense review but I think it's a pretty good overview of some of the topics that hopefully you will remember uh, from your previous principles of accounting or fundamentals of accounting courses that will be um, they'll be presented in this these chapters, early chapters, with some overview, but uh, you're expected to know a lot of this information already, so uh, hopefully you'll find this helpful as we move through some of the different topics. So just to remind you, the primary focus for financial accounting, which is what you all are doing in this intermediate class, is to provide financial information to external users of that information. This would include investors, creditors. These people need different kinds of information to be able to assess the risk and possible return on their investment. And so the financial information that we provide is the key to enable them to have some of that information to be able to make their decisions. So we provide financial information to external users who then use that to make decisions. The way that we convey the financial information is through the financial statements. Everything that we do all during the year is to get to the end product, the end product being the financial statements. Hopefully some of these sound very familiar to you. The balance sheet is your listing of assets, liabilities, and equity accounts. Income statement is the listing of the revenues, less the expenses, and then hopefully some net income, sometimes a net loss. Statement of cash flows helps us to break out into different um, investing, financing, and operating activities the way that the cash actually flowed throughout the company. Then we have the statement of shareholders' equity. You may have seen this called the statement of retained earnings in the past. Now we're going to kind of change that to shareholders' equity. We are notorious in accounting for having different words that mean the same thing just like we do in the English language. So if you're ever unclear about some of these um, bits of information or the, the different uh, words that are used, just ask your professor and they can clarify that for you. Uh, financial reporting is simply referring to the process of providing the financial information to external users, typically again in the form of financial statements. Financial statements are composed of all of those statements put together. One is not more important than the other. They all provide much needed information. They provide different kinds of information to the company. Sometimes we tend to think of the income statement and balance sheet as having a little more weight, but it just depends on the uh, needs of the external users who, and what decisions they need to make. And here's our accounting equation. Hopefully you remember this. Uh, the assets, the total of the assets must be equal to the total of the liabilities plus the owner's equity. So the economic resources, the, you can think of this as the things the company owns or has um, access to sometimes, has the uh, control of. And the liabilities are those things that are owed, such as notes to the banks and uh, to vendors, those sorts of things. Owner's equity, uh, we'll talk about that. There are two components typically the paid in capital and the retained earnings. And those, the liabilities plus the owner's equity, uh, we think of that as total claims against the assets, people who have a stake in the company and a claim on the company. Each event or transaction, we're going to look at transactions soon, has a dual impact on the accounting equation. There are always at least minimally two accounts impacted. There will be a total of the debit and total of the credit. They must be equal. They can be spread across numerous accounts in one transaction, such as a payroll expense, entry that has a lot of those uh, taxes that are liabilities. So it can be spread across numerous accounts, but minimally it has to be at least, there has to be at least two accounts in this transaction. The total of the debit then must also equal the total of the credit in this transaction. 
accounting for the corporation. So we changed this a little bit. Instead of calling it owner's equity, now we're going to call it shareholder or stockholder equity. Again, it's made up of the paid-in capital. This would be the monies or the assets that are provided to the corporation. And in exchange, the shareholder would get uh, some ownership in the company. Retained earnings is made up of the profits, basically. So the revenues minus the expenses. If there are some gains and losses, such as the selling of some equipment, maybe a company might uh, have a gain or a loss, those things show up there in the retained earnings. And then also dividends that are paid out are a subtraction to the retained earnings. So we have two components, the paid in capital and the retained earnings section. Account relationships. We use, again, the double entry system refers to the dual effect that each transaction will have on the accounting equation. An account represents the elements of the accounting equation, so we will be debiting and crediting different accounts. All of these accounts are listed in the ledger. The, and there we go. The general ledger is a collection of all the accounts. And then we also use the T account. Sometimes students get a little bit confused about the T account. We use it for instructional purposes. Otherwise, we would have to have a lot of different ledger books and uh, pages with ledgers on them to be able to demonstrate to you how all of these items flow together. So we just drop a T account, which we'll see on the next slide, and use it as a tool. It's also used in accounting. Sometimes when you have a transaction that has occurred and you need to kind of analyze, figure out, well, which accounts are impacted? So you would draw a T account for each of the accounts that you think are impacted. And then decide did the accounts increase or decrease with that particular transaction. So a T account is very useful in instructional, uh, per for instructional purposes and it, it's truly utilized out in the accounting profession as well. And this is what it looks like. It's just a T. You just draw a T with an account title at the top and notice that your let me get to the debit. Debit is on the left, so debit means left to us. Credit means right. Again, forget everything you know about your debit card and credit card. That's the way that the banks have trained us as they have given us debits and credit cards uh, to think along the lines of, of what they are. We are their customers. So as you go through your accounting, it should begin to make some sense to you later why they, why they give you a debit card and a, and a credit card. But for now, debit means left. Credit means right. Debit does not mean in increase or add. It does not mean uh, subtract or decrease, and nor does credit. It depends. It depends on the account as to whether the account debit increases on the debit or credits on the debit side, and likewise for the credit side. And here are some examples. So your assets typically increase on the debit side. Therefore, when you know which side an account increases on, then you know the other side is going to be the decrease side. I'm sorry. Let me go back. Here we go. I need to write on there a little bit. So this is your debit side, credit side. Debit side, credit side. So debits and credits are left and right, left and right. It does not matter initially. We don't connect it initially to um, increases and decreases. Now when we take it into other realms, let's say now we're talking about assets. Okay, assets, well what happens on the debit side? They increase. When I know they typically increase on the debit side, then I know that they are going to decrease on the credit side. For liabilities, the opposite happens. Your equities and your liabilities increase on the credit side. So when I know that, then I know that they are going to decrease over on the debit side. And here's an example of the accounting equation. It, it sets it all out for you with your assets, your liabilities, and two accounts drawn up, and then your uh, shareholder or stakeholder equity across the top with the paid in capitals um, and that would often be called something like a uh, common stock and you may remember sometimes we have pick accounts that's the additional paid in capital in excess of the common stock same thing for preferred stock and then you have your retained earnings um, now at this uh, very simple diagram does not 
point out to you, but hopefully you remember that there are some incidences of contra accounts. So for instance, you will have a property, plant, and equipment account, such as a building. With that, an accumulated depreciation account um, connects. So other than land, when you have an asset that has a life longer than a year, such as a building, such as vehicles, such as equipment, we will list that on the assets, but we will classify it down to property, plant, and equipment, and then that's called capitalizing it, and then we will periodically will be taking recordings of depreciation on that asset. That goes into an account called accumulated depreciation, and accumulated depreciation is a contra asset account. So we have contra accounts. Also, an accumulated depreciation is an example of that that would go under assets. We have them also for all of the other areas. Uh, you may remember bonds from your long-term liabilities. So bonds would have an, could have an account um, that's called a discount on the bond payable. And that would be a contra account also. When you have a contra account, it pairs up with a, think of it as a sister account, and it has the opposite side balance. So when we present it on the balance sheet, that allows us to subtract that amount and get a net. And here we see further expansion of the accounting equation to include the revenues, gains, losses, and expenses. Okay, the general ledger account. So uh, I mentioned that just a moment ago. It serves to hold the control accounts, such as the, like the, the primary accounts. Then we have subsidiary accounts. They are maintained in a separate subsidiary ledger. An example given here is account receivable accounts. So I may have um, accounts receivable with probably, I don't know, 100 people in there, 100 different customers. So in my subsidiary ledger, I will have a page for, if I'm keeping manual books, if you're on the computer, just imagine these manual books are on the computer now. So there's a different page for every single customer's account. And then at the end of the period, the total from that subsidiary ledger will roll up to the primary account, which is in the general ledger. Uh, permanent accounts, so we have some accounts that are classified as permanent. This would be your assets, liabilities, and the equity accounts. And then we have temporary accounts that represent the changes in the retained earnings. Um, these are typically your revenue, your expense, gain and loss accounts, and we, and dividends actually fall into that also. The balances are closed out or zeroed out in the closing process, and we'll talk about that in a few moments too. I'll remind you of how all of that plays out together. So we have permanent accounts, which we do not close or zero out, although they may have a zero balance sometimes, but we do not intentionally go through the closing process with them, but with temporary accounts, we do. Uh, here's a little more about the subsidiary ledger that I've mentioned. You might have one for accounts receivable and accounts payable. Um, and you see your primary account, which is in the general ledger, that is called accounts receivable. And then you see uh, an example given here is Leland High School that perhaps they owe $1,500. But there are obviously other people that owe because we see the $3,295 is more than the $1,500. So over here on the... Uh, within that subsidiary ledger, we might have other customers. Uh, maybe it would be um, Austin High School or Athens High School. So we might have others, abbreviation there, that would have other balances here that all together make up this number and then they transfer in to the primary account for accounts receivable in the general ledger. Same thing with your accounts payable and others. Okay, so we have the control account, subsidiary account, you're shown here. Steps in the accounting processing cycle. There are typically 10, and we'll go through them briefly. So notice that all throughout the accounting period, you have source documents coming in. These are things like invoices, bills, uh, could even be your uh, checkbook statement, checking statement that comes through. And then you will analyze what has happened. So you have the source document come in, comes in that, that triggers a transaction. You have to analyze, maybe using T accounts, what happened, which accounts are impacted, and how are they impacted. 
and again using two accounts if you need to and you will then record it in the journal record it write it down journalize it all that means write it down record it in the journal this is a one book and then you would have a separate book called the general ledger that is um, it has every account that you need listed in there so it is organized by account whereas the the general journal or the journal is organized chronologically by date. So this is occurring all during the accounting period, daily, weekly. At the end of the accounting period, perhaps at the end of the month, then you will need to compile an unadjusted trial balance we'll talk about. This is an interim report that you just put together for your accounting. It does not go out to anyone. And then you'll look to see do you need to make some adjusting journal entries. Probably, you'll probably need to record some and we'll go into those as well in a few moments. And then you will, after you make those entries, you post them to the ledger account, then you'll create or prepare an adjusted trial balance, making sure that you are in balance again. From there, you'll be able to prepare the financial statements and we'll talk about the order of those. Then at the end of the year, you're going to go through the closing process where you're actually going to set those temporary accounts to zero so that for the next period, you're ready to start over. We actually go through a little bit of that um, at the end of each month for most companies because we, we're interested in knowing, do we make profit for January? Yes. Well, we're interested in, in ne not necessarily carrying that on through to February, but we're interested in knowing, do we make profit for February too? So you might go through some closing process throughout each month. It will just depend on the company you work for. They may do it quarterly. Um, and of course now that things are so electronic with computer and software, you can create those reports very quickly. So you can know just by entering the dates whether you profited in January and then February and then March and then what your quarter total would be. So. Uh, it's very good, very handy to have that information. And then you'll create what's called a post-closing trial balance also. And that will be just made up of the accounts that are the permanent accounts that are still open after the closing process. It's usually much smaller. Okay, so here we're going to talk very briefly about the steps. So first you identify the transactions that occurred that affect the accounting equation. And again, typically this is going to come from a source document of some sort. Step two is to analyze well, what happened, which accounts are impacted, uh, how does it affect the accounting equation, do the accounts increase or decrease. When you've made those decisions, now you're ready to record the transaction in the journal. Again, by day, chronological means that you're going to record it by day, and you will be expressing each of these journal entries in the terms of debits and credits. The transaction must be in balance. And here's an example, $40,000 borrowed from a bank and signed a note payable. So what was received sometimes, they say you can debit what you get. Well, this company got cash, so we debit cash for the $40,000 and we credit the notes payable. Notice both of these items in this transaction are increasing. Cash is increasing, it's an asset, it is increasing with the debit to that account. Notes payable is a liability. The amount of liability is also increasing with this transaction. We do not get hung up on with well, something always increases, some account decreases while one's increasing. Um, sometimes both things will happen. They might both increase, they might both actually decrease, or one might increase while the other decreases. So don't get a mindset that one or the other always has to happen because it does not. And then after that transaction is journalized, here we have the example of prepaid rent at the top and then cash was credited. So pre, a prepaid rent is often called a prepaid expense, but it is not an expense yet. It is an asset for the company until it has been used up or expired. So here the journal was, uh, journal entry was written down or recorded in the journal on July the 1st and then it was posted into the ledger account. I think we got some, yeah, here we have some lines here. So you see where the items come from. So they're calling theirs a, a general journal, page one, and that's what you see documented down on the ledger account is GJ1. That means it's coming from general journal one. And then you'll notice also here the account number is coming from here. 
So this is a, a really good reference point so that you know which account you posted into. If there's a problem, you need to backtrack um, you know, and, and track down some transaction. Then this tells you where to go look, which accounts to go and look in. So notice there are multiple recordings, especially postings, into the cash account. There are a lot of transactions here on the left. A lot of debits have come in. These are increases. And then we have a lot of items on the credit side of the account. These are decreases. So we cannot leave the account like that. We need to know well, what is the balance in that account. And that's what you see here. So you total up the total on the debit side. And then you tally up the total on the credit side. And then you have to net the two. So you'll take the one and subtract it from it, and then that will give you your balance. So the way that we uh, report the balances from our ledger account is, again, the balances. We don't report numbers from both sides. We report the balances. Okay, and this is just a, a very quick overview look at some of the accounts that you might see showing up on the balance sheet. So that's what they tell you they are here. We have assets, liabilities, and equity accounts down at the bottom. And all of these would show up, all of the balances would show up on the balance sheet. Notice, same thing happened here with increases and decreases. Okay, so next, after we have posted all of our information into the ledger, now we're ready to prepare an unadjusted trial balance. Okay, unadjusted. Um, this is a list of all of the ledger accounts with their current balances. And remember, we are checking to make sure we are in balance. So the total of all your debit balances, all accounts, debit balances, must be equal to the total of all your credit balances, all account credit balances. If you do not equal at this point, then you've got to go back to the drawing board. You've got to go back into the books and find out why you are out of balance and correct it. And then try again. Do another unadjusted trial balance. You keep doing this until you get it in balance. Then you can proceed. And so this is what your unadjusted trial balance might look like. You have a listing of all the accounts, right? You have all of your balance sheet accounts here, and then you also have your income statement accounts here. Let's put IS. This is balance sheet. So balance sheet, income statement accounts. Do that again. There we go, a little better. Okay, so, but this is all of the accounts. That's the point I want to make to you. This is all accounts that show up on this trial balance, okay? We're in balance. Now we're ready to prepare your adjusting entries. Uh, there are basically three kinds of adjusting entries, but then underneath each of these three, there can be multiple entries to go along. They're called prepayments, accruals, and estimates. And we'll look at some of all of them. Under your prepayments, we may be looking at prepaid expenses. This is where a company pays in advance, let's say for rent or insurance policy is pretty common as well. Um, and then at the end of the period, some of that prepaid expense would have expired and so we now will recognize it as um, an actual expense. So this would be an asset account when it is first reported on the book. Again, we'll see some, um, some examples in a moment. And then how about deferred revenues? This is where the company receives payment in advance. Let's say a concert. We usually have to purchase our tickets in advance. Well, whomever is going to perform that concert has not earned that revenue. Yes, they have the cash, but they have not completed the requirements necessary in order to say that they have earned the revenue. So they have to record it as something we call an unearned revenue, and it is a liability for the company until they actually earn the revenue. And then we'll have some accruals that we will look at, the liabilities, receivables, and we'll go through examples of those and then the estimate in a moment. Prepayment, so this occurs when the cash flow precedes either the expense or the revenue recognition. Like we said a moment ago, we prepay for an insurance policy or we prepay for a ticket so that that company can, shouldn't recognize it as a profit until they've actually met all the requirements that they need to in order to be able to say they've earned it. 
also referred to as deferrals. So here's an example. So the way that it would initially be recorded, um, I think I've already given an example. There's a better example on the next one. But there, um, as we're going through these, and the, the full slides do show you the way that it impacts the financial statements also. And it, when we, this is after we have made the original entry. So we have a prepaid asset and we have decreased the cash. Now we're making the adjusting entry. So this will cause a decrease in that asset and it will cause our expense to go up. And so how does that impact the financial statement? Well, anytime we add on expenses, the profits, the income goes down and the assets actually go down. So you have a little time to uh, try to think through some of that. It will be helpful to you. Here's an example. I'll let you just pause and read that for a minute. Um, okay, the reason I selected this one is because students often have a little trouble with this. So here we have supplies expense. Draw us a little T account. And so in this problem, they tell us that they have uh, $2,000 in supplies that were purchased. And so we don't know exactly what's left. We're in the accounting department. Um, but we have someone to go and check it for us. And they don't tell us how much was used up. But they say, well, I've got about $1,200 worth of supplies in, still in the supply closet. So now we need to just do some math. So we had the beginning balance was $2,000. Now the ending balance is $1,200. And so we just do the math. If I know I had uh, 2000 to account for and I have 1200 of that left now, then we must have used up $800 worth. And so when you put this entry into your T account, it works. The math works out correctly. So we know then this is the amount that we have to journalize. Supplies expense, which increases the expense, and the supplies account, which is an asset account holding the supplies in, in dollar number, not the actual supplies. So the expense account increases, supplies account, the asset decreases. And there it is written up nicely down at the bottom. Deferred revenues, this is cash received from customers in advance like the um, concert that I mentioned to you a few moments ago. And so the company, when they receive the cash, they have to record a liability. Okay, So a liability was first listed here initially. Now at the end of the period, they have earned some of this revenue. So now we can debit that liability account and properly recognize the revenue which increases on the credit side, so this works out. Follows along with our accounting equation rules. So when a company has more revenue coming in, it does increase the income. This is how it affects the income statement. And so what happens to liabilities? Well, we recognize some of the um, unearned revenue, which was a liability, so that actually goes down, decreases. This one does, and this is just an example of that. They call it rent revenue. Um, keep in mind, a company can have rent expense, but they can also have a rental property themselves. It can be revenue. Same thing with interest. We can have interest expense that the company needs to owe, uh, pay out and interest payable that pair up together. And they can also maybe uh, have notes receivable where they actually earn interest too. So they could have an interest receivable also in an interest revenue. And there's an example for this one. Accruals involve cash flows that occur after either the expense or the revenue recognition. Okay, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Accrue just means to record it. So if we have, um, let's just say, maybe salary expense. Uh, we we're recognizing the salary expense, but we are not paying it yet. So we would have we need to accrue those days that have passed by. So we would say salary expense, salaries payable. 
Same thing with receivables. How about if we've earned some interest from our our uh, notes payable, but yet we've not been paid yet, we would have notes uh, interest receivable, and then we would have an interest revenue. So accruing is just journalizing the those uh, liabilities and such that ha and expenses that have accrued. So these are let's see what this one is. Um, oh, and here is a salary expense. So here, the company has paid employees $5,000 salary for the first half of the month, assumed salaries for the second half of July are $5,500, but they've not been paid yet, right? So that's why we have the payable. So we're recognizing, accruing, recording, writing it down into the journal so it can become part of the records. And I included one here on interest mainly uh, just to remind you of your interest calculation, which is principal times the interest rate and times the component of time. So principal is going to be that amount that's being borrowed. Your interest rate at 10%, so you could say 10 divided by 100, whatever the interest rate is, and you'll get your decimal to use. When you're quoted a rate, 6%, 5%, 10%, that is the annual rate. That means $40,000 times 10% is, is would be the rate that you would multiply out for a full year. But sometimes we have to consider a different time component. So instead of saying times 1 or just dropping the time component, we have to look at time also. And so, let's see, in this one, um, I don't see the dates, but it looks like one month of interest has been, uh, I borrowed this on July the 1st. Okay, so I guess they're just journalizing for the end of July. And so we said this is an annual rate, so we need to look at one twelfth of that annual would be 12 months, so only one month of interest. So there are different ways that you can tackle this, but make sure you understand the concept and make sure you can do it this way. In your calculator, you will enter $40,000 times 0.1 or 0.10 times 1 and then divide the whole thing by 12. If you recognize that this is a percentage and you want to come up with your decimal, then do it. What, whenever you see a shortcut, you can take it when you're comfortable taking it. But until you are, do it the long way. It will always work. And so this is your calculation. $333 that would be owed on this note. So this is an interest expense and interest payable. And that's what we see with this journal entry down below. And then we have receivables. So again, sometimes a customer may or will have a receivable that the company has owed but hasn't been paid yet. And so let's do this. This is another loan. Again, I did this so that we could review the interest calculations. Same thing here, except that we are owed uh, the interest this time. So we have the principal times the interest rate at 8%, which would be 0 0.08, and multiply it times 1 12th because it's for one month that we need to calculate here. And it, so it's $200. We uh, record the journal entry like this, interest receivable, interest revenue, Third classification of adjusting entries is estimations. These are things like your depreciation expense, and you'll need to know which method your company is using. Typically, we need to know if they're, uh, what the useful life is, and is there a residual value. The residual value is also called the salvage value, what we think or the company thinks that this particular asset will be worth at the end of its useful life. So um, this is where that depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation comes from. That would be a contra account that pairs up on the balance sheet. Bad debt expense could also require some estimation of um, the accounts, uncollectible accounts. We also call that doubtful accounts. We call that allowance for bad debt. So this would be an allowance account okay, uh, that pairs up to the bad debt expense. After we have completed the adjusting entries, now we're ready to prepare the adjusted adjusted trial balance now, which includes you take the balances from your unadjusted trial balance and then you incorporate those adjusting entries. Some will be additions, some will be subtractions to the different accounts. It will not affect all accounts, just a few of the accounts. 
And so then you come up with your step seven, which is your adjusted trial balance, which you'll be preparing. So I'm not sure I've been pointing out the steps along the way, but these are steps five, six, and seven. And this is what that adjusted trial balance might look like. Um, notice that we have incorporated, well, if you go and look at all the slides, you'll see where, where these changes came from. Let me lay over that. So this was the unadjusted trial balance laying on top of the adjusted trial balance. So you can see quite a few things were actually uh, brought in and it changed the numbers at the bottom. We are in balance. We double rule when we know we are in balance. One line means math or uh, calculations have taken place, but when we are in balance, we double rule. That indicates everything's been checked out and in balance and uh, we should be good to go. From there, we're ready to go to step eight, which is preparation of the financial statements, which is our primary means of communicating that information again. Typically, we'll start with our income statement, prepare then the statement of comprehensive income, which we'll talk about that one in just a moment. The balance sheet comes from there, and then statement of cash flows. Statement of shareholders' equity often will come in a little before the end. I'm not quite sure why they listed it in this order, but they did. Okay, so the income statement is the change in statement that reports the, um, the shareholders' equity retained earnings sections that occurred uh, because of, um, of uh, the revenues, expenses, gains, or losses. So your net income and losses it comes from this particular statement. So notice the accounts listed here are your revenues and your expense accounts. No assets, no liabilities, and no equity accounts show up on this statement. Only the revenues list all of the expense accounts and of course gains and losses figure into that as well. Oh, let me go back a moment. I want to talk to you about proper form for the accounts also. For all of your statements, always, always make sure you get your header in place. You'll want the name of the company, the name of the statement, and then your dating. The date varies depending on the statement you're working on. When you're looking at the income statement, notice here it is for a period of time ended. So this one is for the month of July. It could be for the year end of December 31st, 2017. So it is for a period of time ended. When we get to the balance sheet, we'll see that it is for a particular date, like a snapshot, if you will. So make sure that you're adhering to proper heading information and also proper form. It is going to matter, and when you begin to work your projects, you will lose points for not preparing your statements properly with proper form. In the business world, it's expected, and there is a certain criteria for preparing your statements, People look for that. Your bankers, your investors, they're looking for those, so they need to prepare properly. Just remind you, notice dollar signs only occur at the very beginning of each column and then at the end. We don't get crazy with dollar signs throughout our statements. When you set up a proper multi-step income statement, that means we're setting out here the gross profit. This is a very important numbers for companies to use for comparison. So we always want to set it up in this form when we can. Then we have operating expenses here. All of the items that are normal expenses in the operating operations of the company are included here. Notice we have operating income next. And then those items that fall outside the, the usual or normal operations of the business, we might call other income or uh, revenues or expenses. All of these items come down here. Typically, your interest expense and tax income tax expense will come down here as well. So see your textbook for some really good examples, but this is important to make sure you follow proper form. Um, then we're going to your statement of comprehensive income. So this reports the changes in the shareholders' equity during the period that were not a result of transactions with the owners. And again, your textbook has a lot of information on this one, so I'm not going to stay very long here. The balance sheet is a listing of the uh, financial position of the company. It includes a list of all the assets, liabilities, and shareholder equity at a point in time. So it's going to be for a particular date, not for a time period ending. So we'll, we'll say that different. Uh, we will classify items based on whether they are uh, current assets or non-current. Um, current assets are things like cash or those things that will be converted into cash 
or will be used up within one year. One year is your uh, breaking point there or the operating cycle, whichever is longer. But typically, one year is going to be your breaking point. If these items are going to be used up or converted to cash within a year, we will call them current. And if they are not, we'll call them non-current, such as your buildings, um, your automobiles, your land, and such. This is classifying the balance sheet. Liabilities, same thing. Liabilities that would be satisfied within one year or the operating cycle, whichever is longer, will be classified as a current liability. Non-current assets include property, equipment, see there, long-term items such as receivables and investments. Uh, sometimes we um, see that called fixed assets, but not so much. Uh, Long-term liabilities have their own classification. This is going to be for your notes and uh, things like that that are going to be due in a more longer time period than a year. Shareholder equity lists the paid-in capital portion of the equity, common stock, and then the second part of that is retained earnings. So we'll have a uh, balance there too. And this is an example of a classified balance sheet. Notice we've got our current assets. And then we have property, plant, and equipment. They just have property and equipment. We have proper labeling after each one. There's total assets. Um, typically, I would like to see probably uh, total property, plant, and equipment too, but I don't see it here. But there is an overall total. And notice here how we represent with the contra account. So we have furniture and fixtures on on the books at $12,000. The accumulated depreciation at this point is $200. This is a subtraction, but we usually show the whole thing on the balance sheet because bankers, at, in time, that number will get down to be a, uh, a book value or a net value that is uh, pretty small, but bankers understand that, that you still have those uh, the furniture and the fixtures. It's just that you've recognized, appreciated it along the way, so you've recognized and absorbed um, the cost that was expended on those assets by expending by expensing it over time. Again, when we're in balance, we double rule here. Otherwise, we have the single line to show that some math has taken place uh, down under your liabilities. Make sure you have these proper headers too. So we have liabilities and shareholder section. We have current liabilities, and those items are listed with totals. Um, then we have a long-term liability section here. Ideally, we would want to see some totals. Here's our total for current liabilities. I would like to see one for the long terms as well. And then we have um, shareholder equity. Ideally, actually, you can really see total liabilities also. So get in the habit of, of putting those. This one I didn't realize had had left that out, but ideally you want to get a total liability section as well. More information. It's just providing more information. That's an E and an S. Okay, and so what I've added on here is to add the total liabilities label here just to provide more information. Then we go into the shareholders equity section right here. Um, this is also just a header for us. Notice all the different headers labeling the information. We have the common stock, which is your paid-in capital. And then we have the retained earnings here also. The two together, total stockholder equity, is provided here. I'm not sure why, again, they didn't do it for the liabilities, but we should have it. But then in the end, notice we have our total liabilities and shareholder equity at 143500 Should match up to the total of the... Assets. So the total of the assets must be equal to the total of the liabilities plus the stockholder equity. Oops. Sorry, started right out the word shareholder or stockholder. Okay. Um, okay, and notice down here your kind of base formula for calculating retained earnings. Clear some of this board off. Okay, to calculate your retained earnings account, you can use what we think of as the base formula. There are there will be a beginning balance. If it's a brand new company, that balance might be zero, I think as we see for this particular company. But do look to see was there a beginning balance? 
A is for add. What items might we need to add? One of those things is going to be net income. In this case, $2,917. S is for subtract. What might we need to subtract? Are there any dividends that need to be subtracted? And there are. In this case, $1,000, which I'm picking up right here. And now E is for the ending balance. So in this case, it would be $1,917, $1,917, which is what we see right there. So to calculate your retained earnings, you can use what we think of as the base formula, beginning balance. What do I need to add? One of the things we need to add for this particular item is the net income. What might I need to subtract? Well, I need to subtract dividends here, and that got me my end balance of $1,917. So, pen is very sensitive sometimes. hard to make it look like real writing. Okay, but that does it for that one. Let's go to the next slide. Statement of cash flow. So this provides information about the flowing of the cash. Cash received and cash dispersed. There are two different methods, the direct and the indirect method, and we're going to be looking at those in, in a little bit later chapters. But we split it out into three different uh, types of activities. The operating activities, the investing activities and the financing activities and, uh, and you can just kind of read over those a little bit. Hopefully that sounds a little familiar to you and again we'll be working on those in some latter chapters. This is what a statement of cash flows might look like. Notice the three different sections that we talked about a few minutes ago. The operating activities, that's the primary operations of the business. Investing activities, those are going to be things um, like your property, plant, and equipment, and any uh, long-term investments. And then financing activities are going to be your long-term liabilities and then your equity accounts. So um, this is just a, a pretty good look at, at how this would all flow together. Statement of the shareholder's equity. So this is, uh, we typically call it the uh, statement of retained earnings. But now we're looking at it as it, um, as it flows to the shareholders. So we call it shareholders' equity. Um, this is changes in the permanent shareholders' equity accounts, the investments by the owners. Sometimes they make additional uh, investments in the company, purchase more stock or um, distributions to the owners where they take some draws possibly. Dividends are reflected here. So it's just an expanded version of the um, of what we looked at a few moments ago, but instead of just including retained earnings, we branch out to include common stock and, and other items as well. The closing process, so it serves a dual uh, purpose. It closes or reduces the temporary account balances to zero so that when we start up again next month or uh, next quarter, then we're starting with zero. Think of it like a ball game and a scoreboard. When you go to an Atlanta Braves ball game, you do not want to see what the score was yesterday. You want to start over and let's move forward from uh, zero. Both of the opponents, the uh, both teams would start at zero, not resume from whatever scores were on the board yesterday. So we do that with our temporary accounts also, including your revenues and expense accounts, and then we move the net result, whether it's income, uh, net income or net loss, into the retained earnings account. And we also close out the dividends. We close it, meaning we just reset it to zero. So we're not really closing it forever. We are more transferring it. The income summary is an account that we use, and it is only used for this closing process. So. Sometimes students forget what that accounting summary is, but it's just an account that we use to close the temporary accounts. Um, here we have um, the closing process. So this is what I would call step one, which is to close your revenue accounts. So the revenue accounts, we have two of them, sales revenue and rent revenue for this example. 
They are both carrying a credit balance. Notice, both carrying a credit balance. So in order to make them go to zero, to make that account have a zero balance, let me just put one up here, that I'm going to need to debit the account. And that's what you see happening here with this closing entry. So the debit to that account, when it is posted, will make that account have a zero balance. I have 38500 on both sides, so that's going to result in a zero balance. The account that will be credited, you all know, we can't just uh, debit an, an account and leave it alone. We have to have an equal amount on both sides. So on this side, we had $38,750 total that was debited. So now we have $38,750 that is being credited. So this transaction is in balance and of course you don't leave those numbers up there. You're just testing it actually before you get it there to make sure that it works out like that. So make sure that you're fully in balance before you record. Step two. is to close the expense accounts. This includes your cost of the goods sold, which doesn't have the word expense on it anywhere, but is often the largest expense account of a firm. So they're all listed here on your adjusted trial balance. There. And that's what you see listed here. All of those items together. All of these are debits. So in order for they, those accounts to have a zero balance, they need to be credited. And so that's what's going on there, both a debit balance, so we're going to credit those accounts and it will equal then a zero balance for each account. And so then we'll take the total of all of these. This total is represented here for your income summary. So notice we had the, this is not income statement, this is income summary, it is an account. So we debited it here for all of the expenses, and we credited it in our prior slide here for the amount of revenues. And then this is what that account looks like. So this is the expenses and the revenues posted into the account after we've made the journal entries, we've uh, journalized, recorded the journal entries, now we've posted into this income summary account which is in the ledger. And we can't leave, leave it with two numbers, 35,833 on one side, 38,750 on the other. So we have to net the accounts. When we do, you have numbers on both sides, you do the math, subtract, and wherever the largest balance, wherever uh, the largest number is, that's where the balance falls. So the revenues are obviously a larger number than the expenses. So that allows us to show a net income here on the credit side. Because on the credit, that's going to be um, a revenue. I'm sorry, an income. And so now we need to reset this income summary account. It's also a temporary account. So we cannot leave it just like this. We don't leave the net income sitting there. In order to close this account, we're going to need to debit the account. That's what we're doing right here. Debit the account for the amount of that net income. And what are we doing now? We're moving it into the retained earnings account. Uh, additional consideration, look for a fourth entry. So this was our, let me go back to that. This is step three to close the income summary. So we closed revenue, we closed expenses, and now we've closed the income summary account. And now look to see, are there any, any dividends? And if there are dividends, we'll need to close those as well. So this is showing the original entry. So we paid out some dividends, $1,000. And so that account has a $1,000 balance in it right now. We need to set that account to zero. Take that off. And so that's what this entry does here in step four. Look to see, were there any dividends paid out? If so, that account needs to be reset to zero. And when you make this entry, we have the debit, 
and then we uh, apply a credit here, so we're going to end up with a zero balance. This also reduces the retained earnings account with the debit. So this is step four. There are only four steps, always the same four. After you've gone through the closing process, this would be at the end of the year, now you're ready to prepare a post-closing trial balance to make sure you're in balance again. This is the listing. Notice it's much smaller than your adjusted trial balance because this is only a listing of only the permanent account. So all of your assets, liabilities, and updated equity accounts are shown here, but it's only your permanent accounts. All those temporary accounts have been closed, so they don't have a balance, so they don't show up here. So that is permanent accounts only. Your revenue is not here. Even this, this is your liability. Remember, deferred rent revenue is not revenue. Also prepaid here, that's a prepaid rent expense, but it's not an expense account. So there are no expense accounts. There are no revenue accounts showing up on this post-closing trial balance. It's a much smaller statement. It helps you to see if you're in balance again. I included this just to uh, show you what a worksheet might look like. Um, this is one that was prepared in Excel and it came through the authors. I have a separate video for you. Um, actually, well, we're actually going to look at one with the Excel format that we can manipulate a little bit. This one won't allow me to. But what I wanted to point out to you is this is just a tool for accountants too. Part of the working papers, you might hear it called that. Very useful for, um, for us to work with those. Notice your unadjusted trial balance. All the numbers, all your accounts are listed here. Unadjusted trial balance is recorded. Then adjusting entries that are made are posted here. Sometimes a firm, uh, accounting firms, might actually prepare this first and put together all of the adjusting entries and then go make the journal entries. So it's kind of up to you and whatever habit uh, you get into, but make sure you get in some good habits initially. So I would say go through the same process that we go through in the class and then when you're ready for this you can do this. This adjusted trial balance is where now we've incorporated the totals. For instance, let's just take this one. So supplies had a debit balance of 2000 The adjusting entry said we needed to credit that account for $800. So when we do that, remember to credit an asset account as a subtraction. So we have a new balance now of $1,200. And this is uh, going to work the same all the way through. Notice the little numbers here. That shows where the, each part goes because we're always matching up our debit and our credit. So we had supplies expense of $800 and we reduced the supplies account for $800. And you can go down through there and match up all of them. Number one, number two, all the way down they will have a, one that pairs up to it over on the opposite side. If you had multiple accounts, then you would have multiple Num uh, maybe like a number one showing more than one time and that would just show that all of that went together for adjusting entry number one or adjusting entry number two. And now notice what we can do here. We have the income statement, revenues, right, that's your revenues, and then your expenses are listed down here. But notice, remember we had some net profit and loss, so the um, the worksheet doesn't really have a good way to incorporate the retained earnings to move the profit into there. So when we get to the balance sheet here on our worksheet, and it's just a worksheet, a working paper, this is not a permanent record, it's a tool for us, then we're still going to have those dividends here. We haven't moved those yet, and we haven't moved the profit yet. But remember, we have to always be in balance, so when we line up our net income down here, notice of debit, we have a credit, and that's what helps us to be fully in balance, which you see down at the bottom. All the totals down at the bottom will work through as well. And again, there's a um, look to see if, if there's not a, a worksheet video for you too, showing the working of this particular kind of document using Excel. You can use Excel now. You can buy the analysis sheets. Um, I personally use a 13-column one sometimes for some uh, different work that I do. So. The green analysis sheets are still out there, but Excel is a wonderful tool too. Other consideration, just mentioning this because it is mentioned in some of your problems early on. Uh, when we see that a company uses a perpetual inventory system, that just means that it's constantly updated. 
um, the purchases, uh, sales and returns of, of merchandise, constantly updating. It's much like what we see if you go to Lowe's or Walmart now with those barcodes. The inventory accounts are constantly updated so that at a glance, Lowe's can tell me if they have a chrome refrigerator over in Madison or if they have one at the Decatur store or, or wherever they are. So it's constantly updated. Um, and then the periodic inventory system, we only update those accounts at the end of the period. So uh, mom and pop organizations, people without the barcodes might use that system, but some, some big companies might use it. But ideally, most people are going to be, and most companies are going to be using that perpetual inventory system so that we're constantly updating every time we sell something. We're going to recognize the movement of the asset, whether cash or accounts receivable. We'll also recognize the revenue that is earned with that sale. We'll have a second entry where we recognize the cost of the good that is being sold in that particular entry. And the other part would be to remove it from the inventory. So it's constantly updated. Either way, perpetual or periodic, either way the company still needs to do a physical count at least at the end of the year. Okay, so that does it for our review session. Hopefully you'll find this helpful. Please see or speak to your professor to discuss any questions you may have related to the fundamental accounting topics. Um, don't hesitate to get into your textbook and look some more. And YouTube even has some good resources for you. So um, if you need some help uh, helping you understand other topics here or maybe some I didn't touch on, please don't hesitate to contact your professor. They're a resource for you.